Hey all, welcome to today's webinar on the state of the market with Cameron Wu, who is going to be joining us shortly in the virtual room. I saw we have a whole host of folks, so excited to walk through things. I uh, would love to hear where you all are tuning in from today. Uh, so we'll keep that going in the chat. We also have our business operations manager, Jake, who is live in the, um, live in the chat, who will be queuing up um, all sorts of, of questions. Wonderful. I think we're just waiting on Cameron. So give us one moment here. Wonderful. There we go. Cameron's hopping in here. And I see we have some sunny Seattle people in the chat looking at coast to coast today. Love to see it. Wonderful. Well, we have our VP of investments, Cameron Wu, live to talk about the state of the market. Um, rates, anything and everything in between. So Cameron, to kick us off and get started, can you walk through a little bit of your background um, and kind of what, what brought you to Arrived and then we can go from there? Yeah. Thanks so much for joining everyone. Excited to be here and talk through the state of the market with you all. So, uh, and looking forward to a, a great session with hopefully a lot of good information and great questions. So my, my background is in real estate. I come from an entrepreneurial family of real estate investors. They are first generation immigrants into the country, kind of living the American dream. So had a really fortunate childhood in the sense of getting exposure to a lot of business and real estate really early in my life. So I actually didn't even start public school until I was in second grade because I was always going around with my parents because they were both working um, in the sense of doing small business odds and ends here and looking for real estate. So there was never really the time to uh, one, pay for childcare or um, just go to school. So uh, that's kind of my background as far as like, when did I start real estate? It was pretty much from the time I can remember. So we would be going to job sites, we'd be checking out land, chasing dirt, um, cleaning up trash off various real estate that we, but you know, eventually we did uh, make it to the point where we could have real estate investments be our full-time source of income. Um, so, that's uh, my family background. And then I, I went through school and went to law school, was intending to become an attorney, uh, loved the education and the academic experience, but I was not really of the right uh, skill set to be an attorney as a profession. So fortunately, mm -hmm. I found a position with American Homes for Rent. They are the second largest landlord in the country. I ran their pricing and analytics team uh, as an asset management as well. I also started a hard money lending business in Las Vegas during the Great Recession. So it was really great um, time to be in Las Vegas and be in the business. And I can go more into that later as we talk about debt financing and just some of the, the history of the recovery of the markets and the Great Recession. So we'll definitely get into those uh, topics. And what drew me to Arrived was I started talking with Ryan and Alejandro uh, and Kenny, the, the founders of Arrived, uh, around late 2020. And you know, their business was really starting to gain traction in the sense of um, becoming a viable business idea where they could actually sell real estate. And as I learned more about the business, I found that it really solved a, an access problem that we traditionally face in real estate, which I lived firsthand through my family. And, and that problem is threefold. It's having enough capital, time, and expertise to be able to competently invest in real estate. It's It's a really rewarding game, but it can also be very dangerous. There's a lot of process. There's a lot of terminology. It crosses over into legal boundaries uh, very quickly, which was kind of the idea of going to law school in the first place. My my own parents, they ran into so many issues that could have been um, solved at the at the legal level or they wish they had the legal knowledge. Um, so just just a snippet of how it, it can be very complex and, and um, risky in a sense, if you don't know exactly what you're doing in there. So 
you know, arrive, you know, we're not going to, this isn't a plug for arrived in the sense of like, Hey, let's talk about the company, but more so how did I end up here? It's that I found a lot of uh, value in what the business was providing. I thought it was innovative, novel, and it was a real problem uh, to be solved. Something like 7% of people have real estate investments while 53% own equities in the stock market. And usually when you talk to people, they're, they're much more familiar with real estate than say, you know, the, the financial statements of, of public companies. So it's kind of intuitive that you would think that there'd be a lot of demand for people wanting to get into real estate investing, but there just hasn't been the appropriate on-ramp or access or resources to be able to do so. Um, so that's how I ended up here at Arrived. I've been loving it ever since and happy to be here today. Phenomenal. Well, I know Arrived is beyond grateful to have you, Cameron. You're one of the most articulate and knowledgeable humans I've ever had the opportunity to partner with. So excited to walk through all the questions today. One note I will make is this is a fireside chat, which is different from our Tuesday, Friday traditional webinars. So if there's any standard questions like more about Arrived, Jake will be queuing up our FAQ um, articles for you to look at. And then we also have a webinar tomorrow at 9 a.m. PDT. So just wanted to walk through kind of the differences as we as we get rolling here. And Cameron, to kick things off, um, obviously we talked about why we're here, but I would love to hear your thoughts around the status of the market to date which is a heavy hitter um, and can go a lot of different directions, but perhaps we start we start there and then feel free, anybody on the line to filter through questions that you have and, and we'll queue those up to answer. Sure thing. I think a good starting point for this discussion is March, 2020, which was the start of America shutting down uh, as far as people staying home from work. And um, that's really the powder keg for the, rise in real estate that we've seen over the last two years. Um, and as we talk about this, it's going to start implying different topics about interest rates and Fed policies and macroeconomics. So it's going to get fairly heavy, but certainly welcome all questions and I'll address them to the best of my ability. So when COVID happened, it really signaled a big shift in the way that America started thinking about housing. If you all remember back to the first couple of days of March, uh, after the the shutdowns happened, every asset price crashed. Right, stocks uh, went down to rapid lows really quickly. It was the biggest crash that we had seen since the Great Financial Crisis uh, of two thousand eight. Uh, crypto prices all crashed as well. Anything that was tradable on on some sort of platform or market really crashed. And, you know, real estate doesn't move quite as fast because it's all individual land, individual homes, and there's not a you know, a stock exchange equivalent for uh, real estate. So the expectation was that, oh, you know, in conjunction with everything else, real estate's going to crash. That's not what happened at all. In fact, it, it did the exact opposite, right? Um, people sought refuge in their own homes. You know, imagine being in a smaller uh, residence and you were locked down and there was a lot of uncertainty in the world at the time. So all of a sudden, people started reevaluating their housing choices when uh, you know, work was born like in an instant, right? And people found that rather living in the urban core of being close to work or whatever metropolitan area that they were in, they found that they could get a yard, get multiple bedrooms, have a house, have their own um, gym at their own house if they wanted to. They could do much more with a single family residence. And that's really what spurred the demand side of investing in single family residential. So there was a huge flight out of the cities, out of people breaking leases in apartments, selling condos and switching into single family residential. Now it's always historically been a good asset class. It's raised a 4% average price appreciation over the last 20 years. And there's, there's always been a little bit of an undersupply of single family residential. But that was exacerbated even more during the pandemic. So with everybody flooding into it, prices started accelerating really quickly. Now, what was the other side of what spurred the demand? It was the interest rates. So typically when your parents' generation, when they bought houses, they were paying interest rates of 10%, 12%, you know, six to eight percent was even considered pretty low by historical standards. And, you know, for the last decade, we have seen lower interest rates, but the Fed wanted to stimulate the economy to make sure that we didn't crash because when the economy locked up, 
and you couldn't go and shop or go out to eat or, or, or go to work even in the, in your building, the, the government was very much worried about slowdown of economic activity. You need velocity of dollars exchange. You need commerce happening. And a lot of that came to a standstill. And or at least there was a lot of uncertainty about that. So they lowered interest rates to basically, you know, flat out no interest rates, you know? So what that did was really incentivize you to go out and take on debt because the cost of capital was low. So we saw mortgages start hitting sub 3%, sub 2.75%. I mean, I even know some people that got mortgages, mortgages below two and a half percent. And that's gotta be a record, at least in America for the cheapest mortgages that have ever been issued. So with cheap cost of capital comes higher prices. So as, as people started going back to work remotely and, you know, it's stabilized a little bit. There's still all of this demand. It was kind of a wake up call that, Hey, I can work at home and I just want this different life for myself. So those were some of the major, um, catalysts for the run up in prices that we've seen in the, in the last two years. So, you know, that, that kind of sets the backdrop for the state of the market today. So interest rates have gone back up. Yeah. Now a mortgage is around 6%, north of 6%, which is still reasonable by historical standards, but certainly compared to the last decade where we've seen 3 to 4% interest rates on average, it seems really expensive. So now the question is, you know, that comes to everybody, everybody's mind is, are we due for a correction? Are we due for a crash? What's right. going to happen? Is the bubble going to burst? So, you know, I, before I get into kind of my own opinions and, and more meat around that question, I, I kind of want to take a pause there to see if we can answer any questions that um, have come up over the last couple of minutes and go from there. Definitely. No, it was a phenomenal response. I know we have quite a few questions in the chat. I believe Jake is also plugging our traditional webinars for more standard questions. So I will drop that in the chat as well. We had one from Alejandro. We have another Alejandro on the chat today, which is phenomenal. Um, our COO is Alejandro as well. Uh, what is Arrive doing in order to ensure it can continue offering high quality assets at the, as the platform scales? So, uh, Cameron, perhaps you could walk through the process in which you acquire properties and perhaps the threshold when you're choosing. Yep. So in, in today's market, it's shifting towards more of what we call a buyer's market. So I'm, I'm going to address the question in the sense of what are we doing today? Um, I, I can also go into more of our process, um, but just in terms of more macro about the market as opposed to arrive specifically, it was a seller's market during the COVID era because there was a limited supply of homes where not everybody was listing their home because they were kind of fearful of people they didn't know coming to their homes, touring them. Maybe they had families where, or immunocompromised um, individuals in the household. So the, the supply of homes had, had really dried up. So that means if you did put a home on the market and there was all this demand looking for it, you'd be able to get the price that you wanted. And that's the dynamic that we have seen for the last 18 to 24 months. So now it's shifting, right? As the Fed has raised rates, generally across the economy and the, the cost of borrowing at all parts of the, the borrowing curve and the interest rate curve have gone up, it becomes more of a buyer's market now. Like that's what we're transitioning into where people are realizing that, hey, price acceleration is slowing down. I should probably sell my home, you know, now before, um, you know, while the season is still hot and while there's still some semblance of a strong market. So the more supply that comes on, then the less uh, price appreciation that you're going to have. So th that's the trend that I'm seeing. I'm noticing it in all markets that we are offering on. Our acceptance rate is starting to get a little bit higher. Before we were offering and winning about 0.1% of the properties, we've kind of doubled that where our, our conversion rate has improved. So we're seeing um, better investments available to us so I think that in direct response to the question, what we're doing is just being even pickier and where we used to have to offer anywhere from 10 to $15,000 above asking price, as we know that homes would get multiple offers, we're starting to now offer less, right? So it it's testing the market. 
and that's kind of the 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 phrase that we're the, the phase that we're going through right now is we see homes that are attractive investments still and we said well let's just try to offer a little bit less and just see if you know what kind of response we get had we done that in the past we would have gotten no response because the listing agents who are representing the sellers they're getting so many offers they're just getting absolutely inundated with calls and you know offers that they don't even look at anything that's not significantly above list that's not the case anymore where offers aren't flooding in because a higher percentage of the buyer pool are not able to make offers so naturally anything that comes in you're going to scrutinize even more so we're starting to test the boundaries of how far below can we go before we stop getting responses right so so we test below and say did we get a response sometimes it's no and then it, the the contract goes pending and they sell it to somebody else and, and that's fine but there are plenty of fish out there so that's some of the offering strategy now that we're executing to be able to test where that market is heading uh it's also a gauge of kind of fear and sentiment so some people will take the risk thinking that their home is just the absolute gem and they would be insulted by anything less than you know what they're asking for and they never respond to us other people though are fearing that hey this may be the only offer that comes in and they're willing to entertain at least a counter offer maybe they're not going to accept our price but they will counter us and they will respond to us so we're finding that more and more and we're testing the boundaries more and more um, but you know the the short answer to the question is we just get even more conservative with our underwriting because we're in a position to conservative in the sense of offering less, um, less money because we know that there's not as much competition out there. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I saw, I saw a few more questions and Cameron, you lightly touched on it, but I would love to hear overall, like arrives point of view on us so far being overpaid due to hyper prices as of late and those depreciated depreciating values. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I did see a few trickle through um, in that regard. Yeah. So the, the question being, is the market overpriced right now? Yes. <laughs> that That's hard to say. Okay. So wh what is price? Price is the intersection of demand and supply. You know, we've all seen it in a, in a basic economics course, and we know that um, th that price is the product of the intersection of those two forces. So as we see all the headlines in the news about higher interest rates and demand subsiding, that is controlled, that, that price, that demand is one half of the equation. And what we don't hear too much about though is the supply. So our position is that accelerate that we will we, that we're almost guaranteed to not see the same level of acceleration that we've seen over the last two years. And I, and I think, most people can agree with that. The question becomes, do we stagnate and prices remain flat? Do they go down a little bit and then kind of trickle back up as the, as the economy starts to recover again? Or does, do we go into free fall? So let's first talk about the free fall situation, the bubble bursting or the house of cards falling. I think a lot of people analogize what's going on today to 14, 15 years ago in the leading up to the great financial crisis. But I, I think they're very different. Um, and I know everybody says, well, it's different this time and that, you know, that's not <laughs> usually, uh, um, you know, people think that we're not viewing it clearly, but I'd like to go reasons why uh, maybe it is pretty different this time around. I think the only thing that the, the two different cycles have in common is the price magnitude or maybe the, the acceleration of price, right? So uh, 15 years ago, if you all remember, Real estate from 2000 to 2006, just, you know, it was, it went parabolic, much like it went over the last two years, right? So the price, you know, compared to a couple of years ago is extremely high, but we have to remember that's in the context of low interest rates, right? So there's a, there's a couple of forces that will, that I believe, uh, make prices today reasonable in light of what they will be going forward. Okay. I don't think like candidly, I don't think a crash is happening. And here's a couple of reasons why we have now wall street money in the single family residential asset class, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing from uh, home ownership and just affordability of housing perspective. I think that's, you know, an issue to be discussed, but what it does offer is a price floor. So when wall street has hundreds of billions of dollars, lined up, ready to invest in single family assets. 
it means that as prices decline, they're, you're always going to have a buyer come in to be able to swoop up assets because they're looking to operate them as rentals and hold them into perpetuity for an income stream. And when you have that level of consolidated capital that is ready to, to buy, that serves as that price floor to prevent free fall from happening. So let's go back 15 years and try to understand what led to free fall of prices when the bubble popped in the housing market. That led, that was primarily driven by poor underwriting of mortgages. So what happened was we had a lot of people who were acquiring homes that were not qualified to borrow the money. There was a famous uh, acronym called a NINA loan. It means no income and no assets, and you could still get a loan. So people, so the, the prices were kept inflating and inflating and inflating, even while interest rates were seven, eight percent at the time, maybe six percent in some cases, but they were they were high relative to um, people's ability to service that. So a lot of the properties that were sold in that time period, they were the product of just bad underwriting. So the prices were not sustainable, nor was the ability to stay solvent. And what that means is that um, the the borrower of that mortgage was not able to service the debt. So if they missed a payment, you know, there was no possible way that they could keep up with those payments. The interest rates were higher. The purchase price was way too high relative to the assets and the income that they had. Not only that, but a high percentage of people bought those, like were issued those um, loans that they shouldn't have been issued. So there was a big artificiality in us that was underpinned by people who couldn't pay. So as soon as real estate value stopped, started dropping and people couldn't kind of refinance their way out of it or just kind of, you know, um, play hot potato and pass it on to the next person, then that's when that bubble popped because there was a huge air gap between the price and the general ability to keep those prices up. Right. So that's, that's that bubble popping is that, is that big disparity between the, the ability to keep the mortgage solvent or to stay solvent on it. That's not so much the case today. In today's market, if you bought a home over the last 10 years, you have pretty strong equity in your property. And you also probably got a mortgage that was historically at a, at a lower financing rate. There's also a, a piece of legislation called the Dodd-Frank Act, which I believe got passed in 2011 or 12, sometime around there. And that was the piece of legislation that forced underwriting at a federal level to be much higher quality. So now there were underwriting standards that prevented the same sort of um, credit bubble from forming where you know the credit was being issued without the ability to service it. So there's pretty strict underwriting requirements today in terms of being able to get a mortgage. So you know that's another big difference that I see where even if you don't believe that the prices will sustain today, I strongly believe that we're not in, uh, there doesn't exist the factors to, to f go into price free fall because yeah. most people who have mortgages, they're not going to be forced to give them up. Unemployment is, an, is at an all time low right now. So we're very employed as, as a country. The people that got mortgages are in a position to service the debt and um you know pay on them and their mortgage relative to the value of real estate today there's a big gap a good gap in the sense where they have a lot of equity so even if they fell on hard times and they lose their job and they're not able to pay the mortgage anymore they can sell their home right so if there is a decline it's going to be a much 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 more gradual decline um, whether it's demand is going to be perpetually low um, or if supply is going to outpace demand, then prices will naturally come down a bit. But more or less, there doesn't exist any systemic weakness, in a sense, where I, I could see that in a short period of time, prices would crumble. So there's no panic. I mean, certainly people are going to lose their homes. And even in the good times, people do. But that's not the same as, um, you know, a bubble popping, generally. The only thing that's in common is that prices seem high relative to where they were two years ago. Yeah, no, it totally makes some sense, Cameron. And I think your explanation did, a, it was phenomenal around kind of that 30,000 foot view and that thesis. If we were to drill it down even further, how do you foresee the higher interest rates 
uh, potentially impacting arrived either currently or or in the future as well. Arrived offers three general types of investments with respect to mortgages. We have no mortgage, we have a 50% option and a 70% option. And we try to responsibly source the debt so that way we have a good mix of investments so that way you're able to um, invest to your preference with respect to the risk reward spectrum that you wanna be on. But certainly as interest rates get higher, it becomes harder and harder to justify putting debt on. Because you know, if you earn a rental income at 5%, but you have to pay 7% on the mortgage, it just becomes a challenge to um, borrow money. Now, here's why you may want to do that, even if your cost of borrowing is higher than your return on the, on the rental, if you were just buying it in cash. There is the phenomenon of levered equity appreciation. And here, here's a basic illustration of that. If you had a home for $100,000, and you bought it all in cash, and then five years later, it went to $130,000 and you sold it, you would have a 30% return, right? 30% $30,000 divided by $100,000 that you invested. But what if you borrowed 50% of that, right? So now you have $50,000 invested in the home and you still sell it for the same amount, right? It's 130,000. So you made $30,000 gain on a $50,000 investment, which is a 60% return. So by borrowing half the money, you doubled your, your usage of the money, right? But you did get a lower income on that property over the five years that you held it, right? If you're operating it as a rental because you have to pay interest costs, right? So that's the trade-off and why you still may wanna consider using debt, even if the borrowing cost is higher than the rental yield. Right. So you borrow at seven to earn five doesn't seem like it makes sense, but you got to remember that you're using somebody else's money to be able to capture the appreciation. So instead of putting hundred K into one home and getting that $30,000 return, let's say you, you duplicate it where you put 50 and 50 in two homes. And now you earn $60,000 on that same hundred thousand dollars, which is that 60% return. So it, it does affect arrived in the sense of like, it becomes harder to justify using higher amounts of leverage, right? Cause we always have to have responsible investments. But with that said, there still is a reason to do that. And plenty of people are putting debt on properties for that reason. But just to be transparent about what the trade-off is, it's lower income in the short term, higher potential gains when you capture the appreciation. Yeah, wonderful, Cameron. It leads us right into a whole host of a few questions that folks have asked. So I definitely want to make sure we address them. Um, Nuatsu, I believe, asked uh, or mentioned Arrived has not obtained a mortgage on most of the recent properties released, uh, which you've seen in our portfolio. Cameron, can you walk through uh, the change in the strategy and approach that you and the team are looking at with this change? Yeah, I think for the first... 50, 60 properties that we offered on the platform, every single one of them had leverage. Now, at that time, we were at a 3.875% interest rate. So in the last three or four months, our cost of capital has nearly doubled for the mortgages that we obtained, which um, presented a real challenge. But simultaneously, even when we had that lower mortgage rate, we were hearing a lot of requests for all cash investments. So the, the line of thought was, hey, if we're crowdfunding it and we can raise the full amount, why get a mortgage? And there are economic reasons too, but there are also safety reasons too, right? So as prices increase, it, it kind of feels um, good to not have debt on properties. And that was the view that we were hearing from a lot of people. So with that said, we started changing our product offering to include properties with no debt. And as the interest rates were increasing simultaneously, we just kind of got on a um, on a the, the momentum of offering more properties that had no debt on them because we were hearing that more and more from a lot of people kind of fearing that interest rate environment. So lo and behold, it, it did end up becoming true that uh, we are at much higher interest rates today than we were. But with that said, we're also looking at a lot of different financing programs that may help us get an advantage over the traditional 30 year fixed mortgage. So we have an awesome financing team who's solely dedicated to finding the best 
cost of money to, to result in the best investment thesis. So I think that's another thing to think about with real estate investing is that picking the right assets important, picking, having good operations for on your rental is very important, but also getting the right financing is also extremely important. And I'll give you an example of what we're looking at right now as a way of just creative financing solutions um, to kind of hedge the problem and combat the problem that we're seeing. We're, we're looking, uh, you know, we're looking at adjustable rate mortgages right now. And we're, we're surveying the landscape because, you know, right now interest rates do seem high. Uh, we've all heard about inflation, which naturally promotes higher interest rates to curb the inflation. We can go into that too, if uh, that's kind of a macro topic that we do want to get into. And as you have higher interest rates, um, usually that's not super sustainable for a long period of time, especially within a country like ours where we've accumulated a lot of debt on our balance sheet over the last 12 years, especially. So if interest rates over the long run are, if you want to make a bet, I would bet that interest rates go down compared to going up. And if that's the case, there is value in having an adjustable rate mortgage if you end up being correct. And adjustable rate mortgages are also cheaper on the interest rate today, even compared to a fixed instrument, because there's less risk for the lender, because they're, they're always making what's called a spread on a loan. So whatever they issue you the loan at versus whatever the market cost of capital is, they're profiting off that difference. And, and that difference has everything to do with risk and underwriting. And that's pretty much what, like how, how uh, lenders make money is on that spread. And also some what's called origination, which is just sourcing the money to issue it to you. And that, you know, maybe referred to as points. Sometimes you've heard on the mortgages. So when you have an adjustable rate mortgage, then you're locking in their spread. So it reduces the lender's risk. And when you reduce the lender's risk, you should have a cheaper source, uh, a cheaper cost of capital. So as we explore these different options with different time horizons, where we're not just a, a 30 year fixed borrower, then it presents a lot of opportunities for us to be flexible on the investor's behalf to get that best cost of capital. So even if interest rates are high today, maybe what we can do is take out debt at an adjustable rate, only be locked in for a couple of years and then reevaluate two or three years down the road. So let's say interest rates do go down. And we end up being right about that. Now we can refinance out of it without prepayment penalties at, and, and get into then a 30 year fixed at that point that has, that's back down to a 4% interest rate, right? So those are the types of things that we're looking at right now to bring, um, you know, expertise to the investment thesis. Cause doing it on your own, it's, it's hard to, um, survey the landscape of financial products, much less even have access. A lot of times, you know, your, your only uh, options are kind of retail options that are available to you. What we're doing here at Arrived is talking with, uh, you know, investment banking firms, private lenders, family offices, all sorts of different financing arms that a retail investor who banks with Wells Fargo is not going to be able to get. Um, but certainly the interest rate conversation is a difficult one today because they are so high, especially compared to what we're used to. But, you know, we do just have to keep in mind that on a historical basis, we're still um, not not that much different than the average uh, rates for paying for housing. Yeah. And Cameron, there was a follow up from Nuatu and I know, Jake, I see you cruising through the chat here. So definitely appreciate you. Um, Cameron, can you just walk through, does a ride intend to get a mortgage? Uh, on these homes after stabilization. So for perhaps for those ones that we don't currently have on, uh, would that be something in the future that we're looking at? Yeah, I'll have to look at our offering document, but I do believe that we could take out debt um, even if we raise all cash proceeds today. So that's a great option. Um, well, let me let me check with our legal just you know, to, to make sure that that is something that we could do as an option, but it's a great idea and thought as, as far as having the option, right? So you raise all the cash today. And, um, if we do have favorable financing rates, we could essentially take the loan out at that time and then distribute the cash out prorated to all of the investors. And that's a great idea. 
Yeah, no, that's a great idea. As Cameron mentioned, we'll take that offline and touch base with our team. That said, we are 110% built on investor, investor feedback. We're building for and by you. So if there's something that you would like to see in the future, I have questions on, please keep it coming our way. Uh, we definitely share that internally and, and work through it. So I wanted to mention that. Moving on here, I this is, we're kind of going to pivot Cameron into what a potential downturn would look like. So Grant had asked, can you speak to the financial position, position of arrived? So the cash hand burnout rate uh, to basically to provide comfort that if somebody was to invest today um, that, you know, three, three to five years down the line, they're potentially in a good position. Some of some of the the numbers I'll keep a little bit more generalized as we're we're still a private company and I just don't want to speak out of turn in terms of uh, the in, the specific internal health metrics. But with that said, uh, you know from the announcement that you all may have seen from a couple months ago, we did raise a Series A of twenty five million dollars from Forerunner Ventures, a very well respected venture capital firm, and our burn rate gives us plenty of runway in the uh, time span of a couple of years to survive as a company and keep um, chugging along at today's revenue metrics. So what's interesting about Arrived is that we have pretty good, um, solid revenue and performance for as early as of a company as we are. We've been selling uh, securities for 15 months now. And um, at this point in our life cycle, we are... Um, doing pretty well as a company in terms of growth rate and uh, margin metrics. And I think that we have a very conservative view on growth, right? A, a responsible growth mentality. I think we do a pretty good job of controlling hiring, really questioning the, the resources that we bring on um, and making sure that we are controlling the spend. So that that's one part of it. But I'd also like to go into the structure of the arrived investment, just so you all understand, um, arrive the entity and the real estate that arrived um, helps Americans fund uh, from an entity and risk mitigation point of view. So arrived is different than a real estate fund in that you're not buying into a fund that is controlled by arrived where you're, you know, a small stakeholder in collectively all of the properties. We put each property into its own LLC that is part of this larger offering statement that is completely separate from Arrived, the company. Arrived acts as the manager, but not the owner of the property. The owner of the property is completely crowdfunded by you all, the investors. So even if doomsday scenario were to happen where World War III breaks out, the economy implodes, and we fail to survive as a company, you still own real estate. 100% it's yours. And that's the segregation of assets and manager that we've uh, established to really limit the liability. It's very equivalent to owning Amazon stock. If, you, if you're a shareholder of Amazon, you don't incur any of their liabilities from a personal point of view, right? You are, you, you are an investor in a security that is backed by real estate when you buy um, a share of a property and arrived. You know what arrived really is, is like we, we help IPO properties that we think are great investments. Right. And you think about traditional context of what an IPO is, it is um, making a an asset or a, a company publicly available for people to have an ownership stake in. And we're really doing that, but at the house level. So we're surfacing these great investments that we think are really great investment opportunities. And then we present them to the public through, an, uh, you know, kind of a mini version of an IPO process. So, you know, we're over here acting as the manager and the sourcer. You here are co in complete ownership of the property. So you're always backed by that. And that's part of the great risk return profile of operating rental real estate. You get the cash flow from it. You get the upside on the appreciation. And even in a down scenario, you're backed by a real physical asset that has high demand. So we have a strong conviction that this is a great part of anybody's portfolio and, um, you know, for the, for the reasons we mentioned, but, you know, we are healthy as a young company, but you're also protected structurally from the way that we've set up the investment. Definitely. And I, I saw Jake had shared that um, ownership doc in the chat, but keep us honest. If there's anything we want to walk through, we definitely can. 
Cameron, I realized I didn't ask, what are you drinking today? Is it LaCroix? What do you have on tap? Is Kirkland sparkling water. I always go oh. for the value play. Switching it up today. Your hibiscus uh, LaCroix is usually the standard. Love to see it. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit here because I see a couple questions coming in around our um, our channels and acquisition, kind of what that strategy looks like and it being based on the market as a whole. So Terrence had a question, Cameron, what are the main channels your company relies on for inventory to date? Primarily, we have purchased off of the MLS, so that stands for the multiple listing service. It is effectively the, the public markets for buying and selling residential real estate. We also have a growing channel of off-market wholesale opportunities that those listings don't make their way to the MLS for one reason or another. Usually they're referred to as liquidity providers, so the wholesalers. So if you need to sell your home in a pinch and you don't have the time or maybe the resources to be able to market it effectively, there are wholesalers like Open Door, OfferPad, uh, Redfin now that do offer the service to be able to purchase properties off market. And then there's a whole channel of kind of institutional larger buyers that buy these properties and then improve them and then uh, either sell them to the public at large or maybe operate them as rentals. So that's kind of the, ex you know, just to briefly go off on a tangent, there's a lot of development in the space. Real estate markets are traditionally highly fragmented because real estate is just an extremely local business. But with the advent of technology and the institutionalization of the asset class, and by institutionalization, I mean Wall Street's pretty much in the game now. And for better or worse, um, it helps provide the uh, capital consolidation to spawn off better services in industry. It's funny that real estate is it's probably, it's by far the largest asset class in the country. Like It's not even close but it's the slowest and oldest and just lack of technology type industry you could imagine. And it hasn't really had to change, but over the last 15 years, it's gone through a big facelift where there's all sorts of different services available now, which include acquisition channels and, and ways of pre procuring uh, real estate. So we're getting more into portfolio deals as well and making relationships with flippers and hard money lenders, those who have other connections that are aggregating high quality assets together. Um, and I think that as it becomes more of a buyer mark, buyer's market, then we're going to have even more channels open to us because, you know, in a seller's market, if you own a home, you're probably wanting to put it on the MLS. It would be in your best interest too, because when you put it on the public market, you're going to get the highest price, but that's not so much the case anymore. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities for us as a buyer and you as investors to be able to accumulate inventory in a different way that aren't going to be as dependent on the MLS channels. And we're excited to um, make a lot of partnerships to help surface that inventory. Definitely. Great response, Cameron. I see a few questions coming in about different asset classes that are potentially moving in to the future. So obviously short-term rentals is one of those. Uh, can you walk through one, when we're thinking about having short-term rentals available and then number two, how those could potentially function during a recession? Great question. Great question. <laughs> yep. Yep. Very nice. So short-term rentals, just to give you a, a broad overview of, of what we uh, foresee coming, short-term rentals, we are in the process of qualifying right now. We expect to have our first couple of investments, um, call it in the next three to five months. And after that, we are looking at smaller multifamily. So duplexes through quadplex, fourplexes. Those are really an extension of single family residential. And from a um, housing and urban development and, and a lending point of view, it's actually the same asset class as single family residential. So we'll be able to naturally pivot to those pretty easily. And those will have much more of an income focus for those of you looking for higher income streams um, during times like these. Those are really great options. And then from there, you know, there's a lot of residential opportunities out there, a lot of hybrid type uh, models that are spawning that are both kind of a ownership and rental uh, sort of hybrid and even short-term rental and ownership type hybrid that uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there. But we are not precluded from making investments in all sorts of real estate classes, uh, 
commercial, industrial. There's a lot of things out there that go beyond residential real estate that I think we could eventually expand into. But for right now, we're very focused on the residential asset classes. That's already a pretty large uh, asset class to tackle. Now, as far as how to think about it in a recession, first, let's talk about short-term rentals. I think that there is some risk in thinking about certain areas of short-term rentals because unlike say an apartment or a single family residence, which is very, it's a necessity, right? Food, air, water, shelter comes next. Then there is some risk for really luxury real estate in exotic places to suffer because people may not be taking as many vacations, but there's still a vac. there's always going to be a vacation travel leisure market. So we just have to be smart about which ones we pick. So I think that it's going to be a market that is not as uniform as uh, residential real estate, but it will be one that still has a lot of good opportunities. And that's really our focus right now is identifying what still works as a vacation rental, even if the economy takes a downturn, right? And we're really focused on that. So I'll just give a quick anecdote to, um, you know, this, this idea, cause I asked the exact same question to one of our partners that we were talking with and he, and he said, yeah, you know, people still go on vacations, but you just have to figure out where they go when people are hurting for money. So with the price of oil, it is right now, if you try to fly anywhere for a far distance, you're looking at probably at least $800 per plane ticket. So for a lot of people, that's going to be a non-starter to travel anywhere that's not in driving distance. So their thesis was, can we find any markets that are within high density population centers? And if they're pretty places and the real estate is relatively affordable, but still kind of a, an experience and a, a way for people to you know, get away from the, the hustle and bustle of city life, then that would still be a great place to invest. So I was pretty convinced by that argument. And I think that there are places out there like that. So um, you know, in a recessionary environment, you just have to be very careful about what you pick because um, vacations, they are a luxury, right? They're not a necessity, but people still will be taking vacations. When it comes to multifamily, I think they perform actually extremely well. Rents in general perform extremely well during a recession and an inflationary environment because people substitute out of ownership and into rentership. So if you're saving up to buy a $300,000 house, um, and now you don't have the means to because you can't qualify for a mortgage, you're naturally going to be substituting into a rental um, of some sort of quality. So there, there are strong tailwinds for rent prices and the performance on rentals in a recessionary economy. So we're at Arrived, we're looking towards more income focus. And that's what we've been hearing from our customers is that under uncertain times where appreciation is probably a longer way away, or at least not apparently immediate immediately apparent in the next two to three years, then they're looking for that higher income focus to also keep up with inflation. So that's what we're also looking for um, to, to make sure that we have those investments available to service that need. Wonderful. And um, I wanted to circle back on the, uh, does Arrive intend to get a mortgage on these homes after stabilization? Nuatu, our VP of legal, John is actually on the line. This isn't um, in place to date but we'll definitely take your feedback to the table. I wanted to surface it as we're, as we're going through questions to get them answered um, as quick as we can. So keep us honest if there's any other questions or feedback that you have, happy to walk through that. Going right along, um, in terms of when we're talking about like housing prices and rent change to the market, Cameron, can you walk through what the lag between a rate inc increase to lowering of prices for buyers and renters might be? Jose had asked this question. Great question. Yeah. So how long does it take for a rate increase to get priced into the market such that is such that the new price is reflective of it? Yeah. Excellent question. Great question. There is a lag for sure. Because what here, here's the dynamic that I've noticed, because I, I was wondering the same thing myself as we started to see interest rates increase, but there wasn't an apparent immediate price um, decrease. So what happens is this, <clears throat> as rates go up, there's you know people who haven't locked in their rate yet, they're subject to that rising, um, that, that rising um, underwriting standards, that rising interest rate. So the payment that they're able to afford um, 
let me let me restate it that way. The payment that they have increases, thus the purchase price has to come down because they can't service the debt. They have to meet certain underwriting requirements. Okay. Now that pool of buyers, they naturally get excluded out because they're no longer qualifying for the mortgages on the properties that they wanted. So as the number of buyers decreases, then supply starts to take longer and longer and longer to move into the to, to move in the market. But it's not immediate, right? There's still transactions happening and there's still people buying and not everybody's a mortgage you know, buyer, uh, borrower either. So inventory does keep moving, but what really starts dropping the prices is when inventory accumulates. And that's where the lag is. So it's not purely rates change and then the next day prices drop. It's that you know, housing stock is totally not uniform at all. So whoever is listing their homes, they're thinking, I can get more. So I'm going to still test the market. I'm going to see what I can get. And eventually enough people do that where the houses aren't moving and they're like, okay, now I got to drop the prices. Now I got to drop the prices. And it isn't until the next cycle of sellers see that, oh, prices are coming down. Maybe I shouldn't list my home quite as high. So then they bring the price down on the market. And that's when you start to see that listed prices start coming down. And then prices that were too aggressive start pricing in that rate drop. But it all doesn't happen until a couple of cycles where people realize they can't get the price anymore because there's still some people who are doing it. And, and like I said, every asset is not homogenous. So sometimes people with really nice homes or have some unique feature that's super desirable, they're still getting their prices. Like there's still some home prices that are extremely high that, that, that I think are relatively high. But, you know, the market as a whole needs to increase their supply. And I would say there's probably at least a two to three month lag on that. And that feels about right because I'm seeing higher inventory and stabilizing prices now. But the rate hikes started about three months ago, really at the end of March is when they started accelerating. So I would roughly guess that there's a 90 day lag between when the interest rates started materially rising versus when it's getting priced in. But the mechanism is not so responsive. It's the accumulation of supply that causes prices to depress. Yeah, no, I, and that, that's a very heavy hitting question. Um, so Jose, if you had more to add there, keep us honest in the chat. I know we're flowing through a few more questions. Cam, are you drinking coffee too? You're on it today. Yeah, I had to drink coffee. <laughs> yeah, I was double fisting that one. I had to drink some coffee after that answer. All the things. Um, Emma asked a question more around like public real estate. You know, we're looking at a, a downtrend there. Where do you see the market going? Um, SFR and multifamily REITs and home builder stocks are already in a downtrend uh, and discounted 25% or more from their 52 week high with current interest rate hikes. We have phenomenal people on the line that are obviously pulling in all the data. Where do you see the housing market uh, for the rest of 22, 2022 and 2023? in the interest of rate hikes? Yeah, so first, as far as public market real estate, certainly has taken a hit, but I think that speaks more to the fact that they're public market securities, not, not their underlying performance. Because to me, it's actually the opposite, intuitively. When I think about the, the downstream effects of the interest rate increases, it's actually better rents and better margins for the, the single family rental landlords and for the multifamily because rents are going to go up and occupancy is going to go up too, especially because of the substitution effect. And those funds, they, they are long-term holders. I mean, they, they hold it into perpetuity. They don't have a selling plan. At American Homes for Rent, we used to sell assets that weren't profitable, but otherwise we kept every single one and we intended to keep them like forever, <laughs> really as income generating mechanisms. So when your income, income generating ability goes up, to me, the valuation actually should go up. But when there's generally a risk off sentiment in the sense that people are starting to hoard cash, they sell securities, they, they want to, um, you know, the term is risk off, they want to take risk off the table, then naturally you have price depression. And also another, just like kind of a side note of some of the price action in public markets, ETFs kind of rule the a, a lot of the... Um, 
equities trading market in the sense that there are these ETFs that have baskets of the securities. So they all kind of get lumped in together. And when people sell the ETFs or institutions sell the ETFs, then you have to sell the underlying stocks too, to like keep a proportional balance and like, you know, keep that basket of ETFs in the same relative weighting that it was before, you know, whatever your offering document said about those. So sometimes it's just the consequence of like, when it's time to sell things, it's just like everything goes down. Sometimes there's right. some winners, but for the most part, like markets, equity markets trade very homogeneously. That's part of the phenomenon. Um, as far as my outlook for the 2022, uh, the rest of the year, I think that we just see stagnation. As explained earlier, I'm not a believer at all of the bubble. Could we have prolonged stagnation and um, not a meaningful increase in price or even just price decrease? Absolutely. Like that could for sure happen. I think when you're a real estate investor, you have to take the the long-term look. If you're running away from real estate from 2008 to 2011, that was the ideal time to buy. So I think we might see something like that in the next couple of years, but to a less degree, right? I, if interest rates go back down, it's off to the races again, right? Purchasing pro, uh, power is going to go up. Prices will start increasing again. So it is a function of those interest rates. And I think in under, in, under any circumstance, supply is going to stay low. So, you know, the, those two intersecting forces of supply and demand in under any circumstance, I believe supply is continuing to be low. So really it comes down to, is there going to, what's the level of demand? And that is very much governed by interest rates. Now, recession is probably going to put a damper on that as well, if that ends up happening, but you know, who, who knows what's going to happen. So I would say for 2023, it's going to be largely the same story. It's going to be a function of macro um, interest rate policy, which very much the residential housing market is always a large function of, but to what degree the supply and demand curves intersect, I'm not entirely sure, but I do think that it's very difficult to bring a lot of supply on quickly in today's market. Commodities are expensive, labor, there's a labor shortage. We haven't invested in producing um, workers who are in the trades and who, you know, we haven't invested in skilled labor in this country in a while. And it's, um, you can see it in, in, the, in the prices of services. If you've ever had to paint a house or get an HVAC contractor or a plumber, like it is not cheap. So with that undersupply of labor and, and high interest rates, you, as a company, if you're a builder, you can't have a ton of inventory because your financing cost is high. So you're going to have a very low inventory of homes available. So the res housing has kind of become like a just in time industry. I don't know if you all have heard the term, but like just in time manufacturing was kind of the idea of optimizing the supply chain. But when something goes wrong with that supply chain, it takes a long time to uh, get products back on board. Like we've seen that with appliances, all the semiconductors are manufactured over in Asia. And then all the parts are imported in because companies don't want to be holding that on their balance sheet. So when interest rates are high, the, the cost of borrowing that money to keep it on your balance sheet is also high. And if you have low demand, then like that, that's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. So companies aren't going to have a lot of inventory of anything on hand. So even if demand starts increasing again, it's going to take a while for the supply to come online. Right. And people are also locked into their current interest rate. Like I was saying earlier, if you bought a house in the last 10 or 12 years, you're probably in a mortgage at like three to 4%. And if interest rates right now are 6%, you're not going to sell your house, or at least you have to have a really strong reason to sell your house because you're going to substitute into something that's a higher payment than what you're paying today. Yeah. So that's why I don't think that supply is going to be very, a, a, an easy problem to solve coming online. And it probably is the, the biggest problem that our country as a whole needs to solve if we want to provide better housing for everyone. You know, we can, we can dink and dunk with interest rates all day long like the Fed has over the last two decades, but until you fix the supply problem, housing is going to continue to be a problem or housing affordability. So, you know, again, I don't see a scenario where the markets crash, but certainly I, I estimate a flat period for, for a bit. 
Yeah, you gave me a, a little bit of never sell for a loss um, vibes there, Cameron. So definitely ap appreciate you walking through. I know we're we're coming up on time and there's two minute two questions that we have um, before we close our virtual doors. But we had feedback from Spencer around this and then I saw a question filtered in from Wayne as well. So Cameron, can you walk through kind of what's going on with renters? Uh, mortgage rates are rising and unemployment unemployment is low, but the recession may be on the horizon. So what is Arrive seeking from tenants and the rental marketplace as a whole? This is a phenomenal question. I know that it's probably like multi-layered. Um, so kicking it over to you. I think my answer would be the same regardless of there was a recession or not, because the my my experience in the rental industry and just having seen a lot of different tenancies and leases and, and just households come and go is that you need to prioritize occupancy and you need to provide a good safe place for people to live that they feel comfortable in and not um not argue on the margins of things so provide good maintenance keep people happy keep them nested and anchored to where they live and a big part of what we do is execute two-year leases from the outset and that's a big part of our strategy to maximizing long-term cash flow so some shops will optimize rents in place so they try to get they try to push the envelope on the rents that they're able to achieve for their assets and that's a strategy that is not without its risks because you risk you, you do risk a lot of vacancy some people will leave out of principle based on rent increases just because you know they're they're anchored to the price that they got in so when we look for tenants we are looking for the longer term tenant who is willing to stay two years as an initial commitment as opposed to a one-year tenant who may be one and done whenever i think about our leasing policy i actually think about my own circumstances because i was exactly the kind of tenant that we don't want to have i moved to seattle in july mm -hmm. and i signed a, a one-year lease and as soon as I got here, I started looking for a house. One, I didn't love, I didn't love the rental house that I got in at, but you know, I, I did intend to buy, especially when I saw that the interest rates were sub 3% um, that I could get. So I stayed in my rental for about three months and then I was gone. And you know, <laughs> I, I am the model tenant <laughs> that we're trying to avoid here. Had it been a pol had had the landlord had a policy that you know two year rents are the minimum, that probably would have deterred me from finding that location. I'd be like, yeah, I mean, you know, let me move on. That that place is not for me. So we're looking for people that are willing to uh, make that initial commitment because we think that over the long run, they're going to end up staying four years, five years, when the industry average is about two and a half to three years, because you're you're bringing in a lot of people that are those one and dones. But you're also bringing in people that intend to be five year and 10 year tenants. So, you know, with that mix, you end up at about 2.8 years for the average tenancy stay. So, we're really focused on biasing towards those long term tenants. And then hopefully, we uh, realize average stays of four, or five, six years. It would be great that for the holding period of any arrived investment, we have one household. So, we have the initial vacancy period, and then it's never vacant until we decide to sell it. So, that that's some insight into the overall strategy, but uh, it, it's not any different with respect to a recession. I will say that what what we will be sensitive to in a recessionary time is that try to be a very humane company. So people will fall on hard times, and we're committed to um, f finding different paths. Um, if somebody can't pay their rent, you know we don't want to evict them. We're going to find other ways to compromise in terms of like maybe a cash for keys program where we give them some amount of money to um, leave the premises in a timely manner and return it back into moving condition, but not file an eviction. Cause that's the last thing that anybody needs in a recessionary time is like to just get beat up when they're already down. So um, we'll certainly be cognizant of that and continue to employ the program um, that we already do. But I, I do foresee that um, in a recession, your your renter class is definitely going to fall on some hard times or some some slice of it so we just want to be good partners in the community um and, and it's really just a win-win for everyone including the investors because if you get an eviction tenant and they've got nothing to lose you know they're, they're not going to take care of the place there's no incentive to um their security deposits already forfeit they're going to have an eviction on their market they're probably scared and like you know, start clamming up and not responding to you uh 
and that can result in some big damages on your property. So that that's not what you want to do. So we're definitely cognizant of that and um, we'll plan accordingly. Definitely. I know you talk about taxes, trash, toilets, damage. We don't want that. <laughs> you typically talk about Cam in our traditional webinars. Jake also just posed a, posed a great question. Obviously today was focused around general market, but we would love to hear from you if there's any future topics for a fireside chat that you're of interest. So feel free to either give us a thumbs up or share that. You can also email support at arrived homes. I saw there's one other fun question that popped in here, Cameron, that we'll close things out after, but would love to hear your personal investment mistakes and perhaps what you learned from it. And this can be like granular 30,000 foot view. Um, and then we will close out from there. Hmm. <laughs> I, I can, uh, yeah. So just as a general investment mistake, um, and this one doesn't really have much to do with real estate, but you know, since we, since we're on this topic of my mistakes, I think that <laughs> thinking that you can beat the market from a trading point of view is, is something that I learned. So I, I was an early investor in crypto, um, thanks to one of my teammates, uh, from, from age for our, and you know, it was, it was, it was good times. Everything was going up. And then, um, you start getting a little bit cocky and trying to trade the market thinking that you have some sort of like informational advantage or that like you can see things that other people don't and in any kind of market it is true that things are extremely efficient and hard to beat so i've very much over the years switched to more of a i have convictional belief in something and then i just i get in and then i just try not to look at it for a long time Maybe I miss some opportunities, but I'm much more likely to trade myself into a loss than into a gain. So I try to avoid active trading now. That's not that's not going to be true for everyone. There's some excellent traders out there who do have that knack and who do have that edge. And by all means, like employ it and ex exploit it. But for me, and I think for a lot of people, you trade yourself into losses more than often than gains. Definitely. No. And I, I know that's a heavy hitting question. We could probably spend a webinar on do's and don'ts or a day in the life of Cameron. So definitely appreciate it. Um, Cameron, any closing remarks before uh, we close our virtual door? Um, Y'all had some great questions, so I really appreciate it. And if we weren't able to get every, to everything, please reach back out and I would love to answer all the questions. Um, I, I do see one more quick one that I can take a stab at from Tom, just because it's it's right here in my view. So yeah. we're hoping for a flat scenario, but do we prepare for a much worse scenario, a depression? And if that happens, demand may disappear for a while and the entire housing market could become extremely cold. So I, th I think that like there's, there's two ways to answer that. So first, if we have a property with some debt on it, we have really good debt service coverage ratios, which means the, the rental income being generated, what is the ratio between that versus the uh, cost of your mortgage, like each mortgage payment? So right now we have a coverage ratio of two to one. And what that means is that for every uh, $1 of debt that we have to service, then we're earning $2 of income. So we have a pretty big buffer to stay cash flow positive on these investments. And then the, the other part of it is that we have um, assets that don't carry any debt on them. So when they don't carry any debt, you, you're still getting the cash flow. And even if it's reduced because I'm really catastrophic type um, macro systemic depression for, for a long time, you know, maybe there's no cash flow. Maybe all of it goes towards property taxes, insurance, and just keeping it afloat, but you still have your equity in the property. And if, if that's the scenario we're in, the financial markets are going to be in an absolute state of turmoil. So if you're making zero cash flow and maybe your property lost 20% in value, don't open your stock portfolio then because it's going to look much worse than that. So with that said, real estate is a great asset to be in generally. I have a lot of my own, you know, net worth tied up in real estate in, in, in a lot of sense. And I feel good about it at night because it's backed by a necessity, right? So if, if you know, if you can invest in something that there's always perpetual demand for it, even if it's not as strong as it could be, you know, that, that's the kind of asset class that I, I do want to be in. But um, from an arrived specific point of view of how we structure our investments, there, there is 
a healthy dose of conservatism built into the way that we invest, which does help at least mitigate a lot of the um, negative scenarios uh, that, that you're talking about. Yeah, that's wonderful. I saw Jake was able to, to jump in on a few questions to follow up with Tom. So great questions uh, for everybody on the line. Thank you for taking time today with us. As Cameron mentioned, if there's any questions that we missed or you would like further clarification on, feel free to email support at arrivedhomes.com. Otherwise, we have our traditional webinars on Tuesday uh, and Friday. We won't have Friday this week, but traditionally those are two days a week. Uh, so feel free to attend those. Um, additionally, you can catch us on social, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Cameron, I think our carrier pigeons are out and about. Oh. Um, so those are, <laughs> they're always there. We have a couple properties available to invest in uh, to date that live on our invest page. If you haven't gotten started, we recommend creating an account so you're ready to go. Um, and we will have more properties coming soon for you to invest in. Um, and Cameron, thank you so much for your time today. And Jake in the chat, I saw our director of branding content was in there as well, uh, Brett and all of our team on the line. We will catch you all later. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks all.